I tell you what, it was 55 years ago that the Lord touched my life. And when I first got turned on to the Lord, I'd never heard that a person had been healed in the last 2,000 years. I didn't know it, but immediately I just started believing for healing. The Holy Spirit just opened up my heart to realize Jesus is the same. So anyway, for a period of time, I pastored three little churches and for a period of time, it was all about me just taking the word and believing and wanting to see it come to pass because I'd never seen it uh, on that scale in anybody's life. And so for a period of time, it was all about me just proving that these things worked. But you know, after a while, like I was sharing this morning, the Lord showed me it was about discipleship, not just making converts. And I began to start having the desire to impart these truths to other people. And now, you know, I'll be turning 74 next uh, month. And now I'm at a place to where, man, uh, I mean, I still enjoy seeing people heal. I see and I enjoy seeing things, but honestly, if I never saw anything happen, I, I just get thrilled to see Ashley and Carly up here talking about their daughter being alive, having a granddaughter, them being on television and reaching people. And I could just go through and start naming so many names of people's lives that have been changed. And that's what really excites me. And I believe that that's the way that the Lord is. He, he really wants us to raise up other people. That was his command. And so that's what Karis is all about. And man, we're glad that you're here. And we're looking for a few good men and women, us and the Marines. Amen. Amen. We're looking for people who are willing to give their life to not only think about themselves, but to think about, man, this culture is just, I, I believe that we are in a great awakening. You can't prove it by listening to the news, but God spoke that to me March the 5th, 2021. And I believe we're going to see things turn around. But I tell you, barring an intervention from God, this nation is just doomed. Now, I believe that it's not because God's turning it around, but we need people to stand up. It's not going to happen sovereignly. God's not going to do it outside of people. It says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. There's many people that'll just pray and they'll say, God, I believe you can do anything. And they'll pray for the nation to change or whatever, but they wouldn't dare stand up for the truth. They wouldn't dare speak out. They won't even go vote and stuff like that. I tell you, God doesn't do things outside of us. He has to flow through people. And so we need people to stand up and you can't stand for what you don't know. And if we've had our values skewed by this weird culture that we live in, then uh, man, we've got to get hold of the truth. And that's what Karis is all about. So tonight, I just want to share with you that uh, God has a purpose for every one of you. You know, many times people think that, uh, you know, their parents, they, they might have been conceived out of wedlock uh, they may have been raised in a situation where the parents told them, you know, I wished you were never born. And there's just all kinds of weird things that happen to people. But regardless of what your background is, you, you were not a mistake. God conceived you. You know, I want to share this verse with you out of uh, Psalms chapter 139. I'm sure many of you have heard this before. But in Psalms 139... And in verse 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully. And well, let me just back up one verse. Verse 13, for thou hast possessed my reins. The reins are what in the Old Testament, what we call our heart today. This is talking about that God possessed us. Thou hast uh, covered me in my mother's womb. Even when you were in your mother's womb, God was involved in this. And in verse uh, 15, 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. You know, this is the King James and this is awkward. Uh, if you could put up the NIV translation 
of that 16th verse for me. It says it more in uh, modern technology. It says, uh, or modern language, your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Did you know this is for every single person? This is, this is a sideline, but you know, there's a lot of people that I even heard, uh, I'm not gonna call his name, I started to, but anyway, one of our senators say that the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion, that Jesus would be for abortion. That is an absolute lie. And he's a, a minister, so-called minister. He actually pastors the church that Martin Luther King used to pastor. And he said that Jesus would support abortion. This right here shows you that God, while you were still in your mother's womb, had every day of your life written out. Did you know that it was written in God's book about your life while you were still in your mother's womb that you would be here on March the 15th at campus days? This was God's will and it was written. God had this in his plans for you. You aren't a mistake. Whether your parents knew you was coming or not, God knew you was coming and he wrote in his book a plan for your life. This is so significant because our culture today, first of all, they don't even acknowledge God and the people who do acknowledge God, they believe that he's a distant God and they don't understand this level of uh, interaction and planning for your life. And so they live without a purpose. This is the reason that people are committing suicide. Did you know that there are, in some places, I've actually heard that suicide is the number one cause of death in certain situations. That's just terrible. It's people that don't feel like their life matters, that they have no purpose for their life. And so the average person does not have this perspective, but God, according to this passage of scripture, wrote your life out. Now he doesn't plan it. He doesn't make his will for your life come to pass. I guarantee you the people that are drug addicts, the people that are murderers and liars and thieves, God didn't write that. That's not what he wrote about your life. So he doesn't enforce it and make you follow it, but he has a perfect plan for you. And I can guarantee you God has never planned for anybody to be a failure. God has never planned for anybody to just occupy space and do nothing. Now, God's got different plans for each one of us, but he has a plan for you that nobody else can fulfill. You know, right now I'm spending over a million and a half dollars per month on television time. That's just the broadcast air time. That's not including all of the materials we send out, the people that it has to take to produce it and do all of these things. But if I spent 10 times that much money, did you know that there's people that you know that I'll never reach, they'll never hear of me, but you have a purpose. God has you in a place that he wants to use you. And just like Ashley and Carly were talking about, man, I feel so honored that God used me to be a part of their blessing. It, he could have used somebody else. It wasn't me, but it was the truth that I was sharing. And I'm just so honored. What would happen if you begin to do what God called you to do. There's people that you have their miracle on the inside of them. And there's people that will die and go to hell. There's people that they, they will experience death, that they'll go through great tragedy. There's divorces that will happen. There's all kinds of things that'll happen if you don't live up to what God wrote. Think of the 63 million babies that have been aborted in the United States since Roe versus Wade. Think what God had written in their book. Think what God's plans were for them. Man, there's no telling the inventions that we could have had. There's no telling the difference that things could have made. Did you know in, 19, in 2022, I, or I th it might've been 21, that the leading cause of death in the world was abortion. Do you know in New York City, there were 220 something more black babies aborted than there were born. They actually had a negative increase in the population among the blacks because of abortion. That's unbelievable. What would those kids have done? What would their life have been like? 
And what would our life be like? How many people would your life touch? You know, there was a man uh, when I was a kid that he was an airline pilot and um, he was in our church and most people didn't like Gene Price because he was just dogmatic. He was tough. And I, there was times I didn't like him, but you know what? I paid attention to what he said. And that man impacted my life. And when my dad died, I was 12 years old. He kind of took me under his wing and did some things and took me up in a, uh, a plane. He was an airline pilot and took me on a ride and he did some things for me. And you know what? That, that was a powerful impact on my life. And I remember, I don't remember the exact time, but it was 20, 30 years after I was already in ministry and stuff. And I went back to visit him and I was just thanking him and saying, you'll never know what your influence did in my life. He was just a Sunday school teacher. He was an airline pilot. He wasn't in ministry, but he impacted me and he broke down crying and he says, my life has never counted for anything. He says, my life has been wasted. And I began to tell him, I said, man, that's not true. You impacted me. You know, I had a youth director that when my dad died, this guy was going through seminary over in Fort Worth and he got up at five o'clock every morning and drove 20 something miles from Fort Worth to Arlington, Texas. And he went and played tennis with me every morning just to spend some time with me. And he didn't do anything great. I didn't learn a lot of spiritual truths through him, but he showed compassion. And did you know that that man just transformed my life? And I could go on and on and on talking about people that you'll never hear about, but I guarantee you they impacted me. And every one of you have people that God has planned for you to impact, not only impacting other people, but he has plans for your life to make it better than you could have ever imagined. If you don't wake up in the morning just absolutely excited, like, God, you're awesome. What is going to happen today? If you aren't excited about your future, I can guarantee you, you have not found what God wrote in your book because his plans for your life are better than your plans could ever be. Unless you have that excitement about the future, you have not found God's plan for your life. I believe that with all of my heart. You know, when I was a little kid, even before I got born again, five and six years old, I don't even know how this happened, but I just knew that there's bound to be a purpose for me. And I remember at a five and six year old, I'd go out in the backyard and just lay down at night and look up at the stars and think about a th a things that were, were way too big for me, but I just knew. And I I'd pray and say, God, what's your purpose? What, what is my place in all of this? Matter of fact, my mother was, a, was uh, concerned about what I was doing because night after night, I'd just go lay in the backyard and look at the stars. And she actually told me to, what are you doing out there? And I had to start hiding. <laughs> but I knew as a little kid that God had a purpose for me. I've lived my whole life with a, with a sense of some purpose, but you know, uh, I got born again at eight years old and my life was basically planned until uh, I graduated from high school. So I got to where I didn't pursue it. I wasn't insistent on it. And I found out that you got to pursue things in order to find things out. It, it doesn't come to pass automatically. So until I got uh, in my senior year of high school, I honestly didn't think about it too much. But when I was in my senior year of high school, they started having career days and they had people come in and start talking about, you need to decide what you're going to do with your life. And that rekindled that desire. So my senior year in high school, I went to my pastor and asked him, how do you find God's will for your life? And nobody could tell me. It was kind of like, you know, how you'll know your mate. You'll just feel something. You just know it. They didn't have any specifics at all. And so what I did as a senior in high school, uh, I, I started reading the Bible. I read the entire Bible through many times. I'd stay up until two or three o'clock every night. Just, I figured that the answer had to be in the Bible someplace. And I actually bought multiple commentaries and read not only through the Bible, but I read commentaries about it. And I honestly didn't get much out of it because I was buying Baptist commentaries. Uh, so I didn't get a lot, but I was seeking. And then when I graduated from high school and I was in my first year of... Um, college at Christmas time, our church group 
had a uh, thing where we went to Cloudcroft, New Mexico, and we would go sledding and tubing during the day and things. And then at night, we'd come together and, and somebody would give a devotion. And, uh, you know, we, it was just a good time. And it was in between Christmas and New Year's of 1967. I was in my first year of college. And so anyway, uh, during one of those devotions, a man read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And that says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. And when he came to that last phrase about you will prove, he said that word prove means to make manifest to the physical senses. See, I believe that God had a purpose for me. I just didn't know how to find it out. And it said there, you will prove, you will make manifest to your physical senses the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And when he read that, man, I mean something leapt on the inside of me. And I said, this is it. This is what I've been seeking. And so from Christmas 1967 till March the 23rd, 1968, all I did was study Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, and say, God, how do you become a living sacrifice? What does that mean? And then what does it mean to renew your mind? And I was just meditating on this. And often I'll talk about March the 23rd, 1968, when God appeared and showed me his glory. And it, it was awesome and I start with the testimony there, but actually it was seeking to know what God's will and purpose for my life. That's what got me going. And I believe that this is why you're here. You know that there's something more. I mean, if you weren't, if you were 100% satisfied and didn't want any difference, and if you didn't know that there was something more, you wouldn't be here. The very fact that you're here, it's because you feel that there is more for you than what God than what you've experienced. And I think that's true for every one of us. There's not a single person in here, myself included, that has maxed God out. God has more for us than what any of us have experienced. And so it's really good that you've recognized this and you've come here seeking to find out God's will. How do you know? Man, I could, I could preach on Romans 12, 1 and 2 for weeks because this has changed my life. That book that Mike was giving away tonight, How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will is based on that. You can get that, and I promise you what worked for me will work for you. But let me just take a couple of things. There's multiple things. You've got to be a living sacrifice, and you've got to renew your mind. And again, I could minister on that to a large degree. But let me share two other things with you. It says in Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That is not saying that if you just delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you anything that you want. He'll give you a new mate because you don't like the one that you have. He'll give you a new house, a new car, that this is his uh, invitation for you just to get anything you want. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying that when you put God first, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will put his desires in your heart is what that's talking about. And you know, nearly every one of you, I'm sure, has experienced this, that maybe before you got born again, you might have been into pornography, you might have been into sexual things, you might have been into drugs, you might have been into all kinds of things. And when you get born again, God just changes your heart. Some of the things that you used to do, you don't want to do anymore. This is what it's talking about. When you put God first in your life, he will put his desires in your heart. So let me apply that to how do you find God's will about whether or not you're supposed to be here at Karis? Well, if you have a desire to be here, I believe that that's God. If you are delighting yourself in the Lord, you can't say that every desire that you have is from God because if you haven't put God first, you may have wrong desires. But when you can truthfully say that, God, I want you above everything else. I, I want to serve you with all of my heart. And if you do that, and if you have a desire in your heart to do something, that's God. You know, I mentioned this morning that I had no desire for a Bible college. I'd had people ask me to do it, and I just had no desire for it. And then in uh, 1993, I was in England 
And I mean, out of the blue, the Lord just spoke to me, start a Bible school. And instead of rejecting it, I mean, I got excited. The desire became so strong that I, I wanted to come back. That was in June, June the 22nd of 1993. And I wanted to come back and start in August. And man, my staff just said, there is no way this is going to happen. And then my board intervened and they said, you got to give us a little bit of time. So we didn't start until September of 94. But I mean, I just all of a sudden had a tremendous hunger for it. And you know what? The way that I knew that was God was because I had been for decades going in this direction. And all of a sudden my desires just changed. This is one of the ways that God speaks to you. You know, when I was pastoring a little church in Seagaville, Texas, and uh, the biggest crowd we ever had, I think, was 12. Most of the time we had five there, and three of those were my wife and me and my son. <laughs> and uh, we held five services a week, and people were telling me, leave, children, and get out of there. Go someplace where people will receive what you've got to say. But I just love children. I mean, it was hard. It was one of the hardest things we've ever done. And yet I was excited. I just, excuse me, I'm saying Childress. It's Seagaville, Texas. Childress was my second place. Seagaville, Texas. And I just loved it. I loved it. And I, one day I was down at the church praying and I was praying for the people. And I looked out the window and it's like everything went from color to black and white. I looked out the window and I thought, this is the ugliest place I think I've ever seen. And all of a sudden, I hated Seagaville. I mean, I hated it. I said, why in the world would anybody live in this place? And I mean, my desires changed so radically that I thought, man, is this God? Because there's no way that my desires could switch like that. And so I spent about two hours or three hours down in our church building just praying and saying, God, is this you? And it's a long story, but the Lord told me, yeah, and you'll be leaving on November the 1st. And so I thought, man, I got to go tell Jamie. So I went home wondering, how do I tell Jamie that we're leaving after two years investing our life in this place and we're going to leave? And when I got home, there was a for sale sign in the yard. And I went in and I asked Jamie, I said, what's the for sale sign for? And she says, the landlord called and said, she's selling our house and we got to be out of here November the 1st. And so it was like confirmation. And I said, well, that's God. And then the same thing happened when I went to Childress, Texas. I was willing to stay there forever and boom, God just changed things. I went to Pritchett, Colorado. I held a meeting there. We saw a man raised from the dead and there was only 10 people in the church. There was only 144 people in the whole town. And I had driven through there a month or two before that. And I had Don Crow and his wife with me. And we looked at, we looked at Pritchett, Colorado. And I, I started laughing. I said, who would ever live in a place like this? And I started prophesying to Don and saying, thus saith the Lord, God is calling you to Pritchett. I was goofing around, but I prophesied to myself. And... <laughs> I went there and held a meeting and they begged me. They said, you can't come in here and teach us this thing and upset all of our beliefs and leave. And I said, I am not staying in Pritchett, Colorado. And I headed from there back to Texas. And before we crossed the Colorado line, God told me, you need to go back. And I just fell in love with Pritchett. It's one of the most, it, I loved it. It was one of the most exciting times in my whole life. And if you've ever been to Pritchett, Colorado, you would agree that there is nothing to like. It's just unbelievable. But anyway, I'm saying all of these things to say that this is one of the ways God leads you is when you are delighting yourself in him, he will lead you by the desires of your heart. If you have a desire to come here and sit under the word four hours a day for five days a week for two or three years, I can guarantee you that is not your flesh. That is not the devil. The devil is not going to lead you to come here. If you have a desire, that's one of the ways that God shows you his will. You delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's how the Bible school got started. God changed my desires. I knew that someday I was supposed to 
be on television and do every, use every resource available to try and reach out to people, but I also knew television was super expensive, and so I had resisted it. I even had people offer me free television time. But even at that, it cost a lot of money to come up with the cameras and go through everything. And so I resisted it. And for a decade or more, I refused to go on television. And then in 1998, I think it was, I was praying. And all of a sudden, I just got so excited about being on television that I actually, for nearly a week, didn't sleep very much. I stayed up drawing the set and just thinking about it. I mean, I was so excited. I couldn't hardly stand myself. And uh, I knew that, that was, it was time for me to go on television. This is how God leads you in things, is through get, putting his desires in your heart. And then a second thing I want to mention tonight, and there's many more things that we could mention, but a second thing, when the Lord touched my life, March the 23rd, 1968, he not only puts desires in your heart, but he'll also take desires out of your heart. And I was in my very first year of college. I was enjoying being out on my own. I was still living at home, but my mother got a scholarship to go to Durant, Oklahoma and get a master's degree. And so she moved to Oklahoma and I was living at home by myself. I was on my own and man, I was enjoying being free in first year of college and I was just loving it. And then God showed up and touched my life. And I mean, I got so excited about God that I never wanted to go back to a secular college. I just knew that I was a math major and I knew God had something for my life besides being a math major. And so after just a, a week or so, after the Lord touched my life, I just made the announcement to everybody that, man, I'm quitting school. And uh, that did not go very well. Boy, my family hit the wall. I had my church actually come out and say that you cannot be a Christian and say that God would tell you to quit school. I know some of you think that that's extreme, but we were in a highbrow Baptist church that education was everything. Plus this was during the Vietnam War and I had a student deferment as long as I stayed in school. I was getting $350 a month from the government from my dad's social security if I stayed in school and I had the acceptance of people. And so people just thought, man, you missed God. And here I was young in the Lord, brand new. And who was I to say that my opinion was better than anybody else's opinion? And I mean, I had people say terrible things to me about this. And so because of that, uh, I decided to stay in school for a while and I hated it. It was the opposite of God putting desire in my heart. He took away my desire for that. And I mean, I hated going to school and I tried to go to school every day but man, I was so excited about the Lord that I'd get there and start talking to somebody about the Lord and it was time to go to class and I couldn't leave and let them go to hell because it was time for me to go to class. So I'd keep talking to them. And then when I got through with them, I'd find somebody else and the next class came available. So I went to class every day for two months and never made a class, never made it to class. But I, I was trying to go and I just couldn't do it. I hate it. I don't have the words to tell you how much I hated that. Matter of fact, for probably 20 years after that, I had nightmares at least once or twice a year and my nightmare would be that I was back in school. <laughs> and I mean, I'd wake up in a cold sweat shaking and I'd be thinking, God, what's this about? I know that I'm not supposed to be in school. And so anyway, uh, I stayed there and, and I would get together with my friends at night. We'd get together, uh, you know, like at six or seven after we got off work and we would stay up until two o'clock every morning just studying the word and praying. And I even had two of my friends move into my house with me and we, we did that so we could just study the word all of the time and pray. And um, anyway, I was over at somebody else's house one night and we were studying the word and I ran across Romans 14, 23, it says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And when we read that, man, I mean, conviction came on me. And I thought, you know, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be in school. I think God told me to quit. And yet I'm doing it because of everybody else putting pressure on me. And because of the physical things that I'd suffer, such as, 
getting drafted and going to Vietnam, losing money. And I was letting circumstances and people tell me what was right. And I realized that that's sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I told my friends, I said, I'm going home. I said, I'm not going to be in sin tomorrow. And I went home and I, I started praying and I said, God, I've got to make a decision. I've either got to stay in school and do it in faith or I've got to get out of school, but I cannot ride the fence and just let circumstances and people dictate to my life. And so I, I started praying. And let me read this verse to you out of Colossians chapter three. And again, this is just a month or two after the Lord had touched my life and I didn't know the word very well, but God led me to this uh, passage of scripture in Colossians chapter three and in verse 15. And it says, uh, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. And I mean, that just came alive on the inside of me. I looked up the word rule and it means to act as an umpire. Actually, the word that we get our English word umpire comes from this same Greek word. So this means let the word of God umpire, call the shots in your life. And I got to thinking about like when you play baseball, you throw a ball and the home plate umpire, he can't say, well, I'm not sure. No, he has to make it a ball or a strike. And even if he's wrong, he has to make a decision and that's it. In other words, an umpire has to make a decision. You aren't able to just say, well, let's do it over. No, you got to make a decision. And the Lord was speaking to me that I've got to make a decision and peace needed to be the umpire, the one that made the decision. And since that time, I've learned a lot about this, but did you know that peace in my estimation, is one of the easiest fruit of the Holy Spirit to discern. Because there is an imitation for love. It's a poor imitation, but the world will say that they love. You know, two men, two women will say that they love each other and love is love. That's not even talking about God's agape kind of love. That's just lust. That's, that's a lie that love is love. There is an imitation for love. There's an imitation for joy. And people will think just absence, you know, I mean, going out and doing something weird and, and doing crazy things, they'll think that's joy. And that's nothing to do with God's kind of joy. But peace, there is, there's, not much of a, there's not much of a counterfeit for peace. I'll tell you what the world calls peace is just absence of problems. And since we live in a fallen world, that doesn't happen very often. And if you happen to be in a situation where there's no problems right now, you know that there's one around the corner. You're, you're going to have problems. And really, peace is hard to come by. Very, very, very few people have anything that resembles peace. And this is the reason people are committing suicide and that things are so bad. So to me, peace is one of the greatest fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the easiest to, to uh, discern. Once you've experienced God's kind of peace, man, there's nothing that compares with it. I've been through terrible, terrible things. I mean, I've, I've seen people stacked up right next to my bunker in Vietnam, 15 and 16, 20 people high, dead corpses around me. And I've Seen, I've seen a lot of things and I've seen hurt and pain and I've dealt with a lot of other people that go through grief. And yet in the midst of all of that supernatural peace, there was a time that we were, we were in an area that was less than the size of this auditorium. And there was 120 men in that spot. And we took over, a, I forget the exact number, but over 100 mortars inside our perimeter within two hours. And you could see the muzzle fire from the weapons coming up the hill. And I was there with my M16 pointed down the hill. I didn't fire it because they were so far off it wouldn't have made any difference. But I was ready. But did you know with all of that going on around me, I had so much peace. I had supernatural love. I was just, I mean, I was flooded <laughs> with love and joy and peace. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird to have all of the fruit of the Spirit and not use it. I was full, of, I was actually just, I was so excited thinking, Jesus, I could see you before the night is over. 
I could be in heaven tonight. And I was just, I was praising God. And I actually started praying for the Vietnamese because I knew where I was going, but they didn't know where they were going. And I was praying for them that God, if I have to kill them, I pray that they come to know you. <laughs> I'm not sure how that worked, but I was praying for my enemies. I know that you can have peace in the midst of terrible situations. So anyway, as the Lord spoke to this to me about let the peace of God rule in your heart, I just started saying, all right, Father, I'm gonna do what gives me peace. And did you know, as I considered my options, quitting school, which could have caused a cascade of other terrible things to happen, or staying in school, which looked like the best thing. I was gonna be accepted by people. I wouldn't be drafted. I'd have money coming in and I'd have the acclaim of people and stuff. When I considered my options, I didn't have perfect peace in any direction. I wasn't uh, excited about going to Vietnam. I wasn't excited about possibly getting killed. But when I thought about it, I didn't have perfect peace, but I had zero peace about staying in school. Every time I thought about it, it just, God, I can't do that. And so what I decided was I was gonna let the peace of God rule. I might not have been totally sure if that was a ball or a strike, but I had to make a decision. And to the best of my ability, I was gonna say that God told me to quit school. And again, I'm making a big deal out of this. And some of you think, well, boy, that's not such a big deal. Did you know that that one decision put my life on a course that I'd have had to have backslid against God to keep from doing what I'm doing? It was a big deal. And there was, there was only two people on the planet that I knew of who would support me in that decision. Everybody else thought I was absolutely crazy. I mean, I had people, I had the uh, guy who was a, a music director in our Baptist church threatened to vote me out of the church because you can't say that you're a Christian and say God's telling you to do that. And I just told him, I said, I grew up in this church. I know more people than you do. Put it to a vote and we'll vote you out. <laughs> that probably wasn't the right way to do it, but that's what I told him. And anyway, there was, there was some people that were really, really mad at me. So it was gonna cost me. There would only be two people on the planet that would have supported my decision. And there, it looked like there was lots of reasons to stay in school, but you know what? That's just what I felt peace about. And so I made a decision based on nothing but the peace of God in my heart. And since I didn't have perfect peace, I was saying, God, how do I know? And the Lord spoke to me he might speak to you differently, but he spoke to me and he said, if somebody put a gun to your head and had it cocked and said, make a decision. And if you make the wrong decision, you're going to get your head blown off, which was possibility. If I made the wrong decision, I could go to Vietnam and die. And, and he said, which one would you make? And I said, man, there is no doubt about it. The one I feel the most peace about is obeying what I feel in my heart and quitting college. And so I made that decision, went to sleep, and the next day I got up. And you know, here's another piece of wisdom. If you aren't positive, if you aren't absolutely sure, then don't burn all your bridges behind you. Just start moving in that direction and the Holy Spirit will bear witness if it's the right decision and if it's the wrong decision, he'll bear witness. If you aren't sure, you know, just, just head in that direction. Start taking some baby steps rather than uh, committing yourself uh, in a way that's going to hurt you. So what I did the next day, I got up and I decided I'd go to the three people who had criticized me the most. One was my uh, youth director, the one that was with me the night that God showed up and changed my life. One was a friend of my mother's. My mother was a school teacher and this was a school teacher that was born again and she had had a big impact on my life and boy, she had just jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug when I told her that I was gonna quit school because she thought she was defending my mother. She knew my mother wouldn't want me to do that and so boy, she just came out against me as you had missed God, this is of the devil. And then there was another uh, lady that was like a spiritual mentor to me and these people had just turned on me big time. So the next day I went to them and I just told them, I said, I've made my decision. And anyway, I could spend a lot of time on it, but this one lady who was a school teacher, she was a harsh type of, 
she wasn't mean, but she, she was no, uh, she was just no, what am I trying to think of? No what? No, well, she, she wasn't nice. I don't know what else. To say. She'd just tell you what she thought. She wouldn't smooth it over or anything. So I went to her and I was braced. Like I was waiting for her to attack me. And I went in and told her, I said, Miss Ellis, I said, I've made my decision. And she said, what is it? I said, I'm quitting school. And she looked at me and she started crying. And she said, I'd give anything to be in your shoes. And it just totally surprised me. And I said, you would, why? And she said, you know, I don't know how old she was. She seemed ancient to me when I was 18. <laughs> but uh, she might have been a lot younger than I am now. But anyway, she was an old lady. And she said, I've done, you know, teaching school and all of these things all of these years. And I've never known for sure that what I'm doing is God's will. She says, I'd be anything. I'd give anything to be 18 years old and to have heard from God and know that God is directing your life. And anyway, I went to her and those two other people and man, after those three people by noon, I knew that I knew that I knew that I had heard from God. And man, I stood when I got drafted, I never one time doubted it. I went to Vietnam knowing that this was God's will. And you know what? In hindsight, I can say that that's one of the best things that ever happened to me because when I went to Vietnam, I was a Baptist and I didn't plan on uh, quitting being a Baptist. But when I got in Vietnam, there was so much temptation and so much going on that the only way I could survive was just to open up the Bible and put my nose in it. And I studied the word up to 15 hours a day, every day for 15 months. And when I got out of Vietnam and went back to my Baptist church, I wasn't a Baptist anymore. I didn't try and change, but I just started believing what the word says and they asked me to leave. And it turned out to be awesome. <laughs> and I look back and you know what? I, I made a decision. Matter of fact, when my oldest son was 20 years old, I was looking at, you know, I was 21 in Vietnam and we had 21 direct mortar hits on the bunker that I lived in on my 21st birthday. It's like they knew it was my birthday. <laughs> And I saw a lot of things happen. And I was looking at my son at 20 years old and thinking there isn't a chance in the world that he could have been exposed to the things I was exposed to and come through it in a positive way. It is absolutely miraculous what God did. And in hindsight, I wouldn't have chosen it. I wouldn't wish it on somebody else. But for me, it was awesome. Man, God just changed my life. So I'm sharing these things with you to say that, you know, you don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. You don't have to have everything figured out. If you would just make a commitment that, God, I want you above anything else. If you will delight yourself in the Lord, he will start putting his desires in your heart. And if you will let peace umpire in your heart, and just do what you feel peace about. You may not feel total peace. You may have questions and not know how some things are going to happen. But if you would begin to do that, I guarantee you, God will direct your steps. F following the leadership of the Lord is not hard if you implement those two things I'm talking about. It's really very simple. Every one of you have a witness on the inside. The scripture says you will hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk thou in it. It says in John chapter 10, his sheep hear his voice. If you are born again, if you're a sheep, you hear his voice. And some of you think, no, I haven't heard it. It's that still small voice. It's that peace on the inside. It's this desire that God has given you. That's the number one way that God speaks to you. And yet many of us don't recognize that as being God. We want an audible voice or something else. The Lord said, without faith, it's impossible to please him. God has spoken to people in audible voices. God can hit you with a bolt of lightning. He can knock you off of your horse the way he did with Paul. But that's not going to happen very often. The dominant way that he speaks to you is through that still small voice, just through your spirit. And every one of you have heard that. 
I can guarantee you that every one of you at some time or another has had to face a decision. You look at your options and you just uh, make a decision based on other people's counsel, based on circumstances or whatever, but it's not what you felt in your heart. And so you go ahead and head in that direction. And as soon as you crash and burn and things don't work, every one of you sometime or another said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. You didn't know how you weren't supposed to do it, but you knew that was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I was pastoring a church in Pritchett, Colorado, and the elders were leaving on a weed harvest and they felt like I needed an elder to be there with me. So they uh, said, you've got to uh, uh, ordain another elder to stay here with you when we're gone following the weed harvest. And I said, okay. And anyway, they suggested this one guy and I didn't have anything against him. He was the very first person to receive me. I, I went over to his house and ate. I didn't have anything against him, but I just didn't feel peace about it. And so I said, no. And they said, well, why not? And I said, I don't know. I just, they said, well, what have you got against him? And they kept pressuring me. And I said, I hadn't got anything against him. And so anyway, for a couple of weeks, they just kept pressuring me and pressuring me. You've got to do something. And it was time for them to leave. And so out of nothing but pressure, I went ahead and ordained this guy to be an elder in the church. And then the very next week they left. And the next Sunday he got up in front of that church and started telling people that I had stolen money from the church, that I had been doing drugs, that I'd gotten drunk, that I was committing sexual sins. He turned into the devil himself and started lying about me. And as soon as it happened, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that, but I did it out of pressure. And you know, that was in 78. And to the best of my ability, I've just determined I'm not gonna do something that doesn't bring me peace. I hadn't done it perfectly, but I mean, 99 times out of 100, I, if I don't feel peace about it, I just don't do it. And man, God has used that to direct me and it works. You know, Carrie Pickett was teaching uh, in the last year or so, and she said something that just really ministered to me. And she said how she had her a piece of paper with all of the things that she wanted God to do. And she had written out all of these things and had the entire page filled. And then at the bottom, she signed it and then pushed the paper over towards the Lord. Like, will you sign this? Will you sign off on what I want done? And the Lord told her, no, that's not the way you do it. He said, you take a piece of paper, leave it blank and you just sign it at the bottom and push that across and let me fill it in. And man, that really ministered to me that each one of us have plans for our life, whether there are things that you've really desired or whether it's just the way that life has pushed you and you feel like you've got to do it. But you know what? You need to just take a piece of paper and sign it and say, God, whatever your will is, I'll I'll, I'll say yes to it before you even tell me what it is. That's being a living sacrifice. And I can promise you, God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. And I believe that this is why God has brought you here. I believe it's that desire. He placed a, a desire in your heart. And many of you, have a peace about coming here. Man, you would love to see things happen, but you've got all of these other things. How, what am I going to do for a job? We even had a person one time say, I, I live under a bridge. How am I going to come out there to school? I said, we got bridges out here. Come out here and live under a bridge. We had one person say, but I got two dogs. I'm not going to tell you what I told them. I get in trouble. But we have dogs out here. You can bring your dogs, amen. There's, there's, there is no excuse. If you feel the desire, if this is what you feel the most peace about, you know what? You need to run up a white flag and you just need to say, Father, I'm willing to do anything. And I promise you, God, the greater sacrifice that you make, the greater the reward is. And those of you that feel like, man, I'd just be giving up everything. You've, you, you're the one that has the most to gain from this. I promise you that. Preparation time is never wasted time. And if you come here because you feel peace about it, 
and this is a desire that God has put in your heart, I guarantee you, you'll look back on it and think this is one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. I wished I'd have had some place like this to go. I went through the school of hard knocks. And if you live through it, it makes a great testimony. But not everybody lives through that. There's a better way, and that's to come to Karis and take advantage of all of our things that we've learned and the mistakes that we've made. You don't have to make all the same mistakes. So I just want to share that with you tonight and encourage you that God wants you to follow the peace that's in your heart. He wants to, if you will put him first and say, God, I'll do anything you want, then he'll put his desires in your heart. And if you have that, you need to follow through. Amen. So I don't want everyone to respond to this because not everybody needs to respond to this. But if you're one of those that's been questioning, God, is this your will? And yet you have a desire. I have people all the time, man, if I just didn't have this problem, if I didn't have that problem, if I didn't have my parents to take care of, or if I didn't have my kids to take care of or something, man, I'd be there. That's your desire. But we let other things talk us out of it. But if you have the desire to come here and if you feel peace about this and yet you haven't committed yourself, I'm not asking you to come down here and sign something, but I am asking you to just sign your name to the bottom of the page and say, God, if this is what you want, I'm here. And if you're willing to do that, I want you to get up out of your seat and come down here and I'm gonna pray for you and we're just gonna pray that you will have the boldness to follow through and do what God has told you to do. So if that's you, I want you to get up right now and come forward. And I promise you this will be the best decision I think you've ever made. And even if it's not coming to Karis. You know, I had one young guy come up tonight and say he's considering Kenneth Copeland's Bible school. And I said, well, that's a great Bible school. Man, I love Kenneth. Kenneth promotes me, I promote him. So even if it's not carish, you need to just say, God, I'll do anything and I'll go anywhere. I want what you want. And if you haven't done that yet, we want to pray with you. And I believe that this is going to change your life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Let's have all the rest of you stand up and we're going to stretch our hands out here and we're going to pray for you. And you know, just by you making this step, Right here. When I made those decisions that I've told you about tonight, they didn't seem like a big thing to other people, but in my heart, it was big. It could have cost me my life. I could have gone to Vietnam and died. I mean, I was, you know, the scripture says they love not their life unto the death. And I was willing to put God ahead of my own personal desires. And man, I've never regretted it. And you may... You may potentially be giving up a number of things, but I tell you what, it'll be well worth it. Nobody is going to ever outgive God. If you give something to God, He's going to give back to you more than you ever give. He'll never be in debt to anybody. Nobody's ever going to get to heaven and say, God, I gave more to you than you gave to me. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. So, Father, we just all agree with these right now. And Father, thank you for these people that know that there is something more, that you have their entire life written out in your book and it's better than what they have experienced. It's greater than anything they could ever dream up on their own. So Father, we, we believe that. And right now they've come forward and we're saying that Father, we want your will. We are seeking and Father, based on these things that I was talking about tonight, we, we are putting you first. We are delighting ourselves in the Lord more than we delight in ourselves. We are putting you first and believe that as we do that, you are putting your desires in our heart. And Father, if we have the desire, if this is what we desire, we're going to act on that scripture, Psalms 37, 4, and we're going to act and do what we desire to do. Father, we are letting the peace of God rule in our heart. And right now they've come forward, Father. We are saying that we feel a stirring and we just right now consider our options and we make a commitment that we are gonna let peace be an umpire. 
We aren't going to go by our own opinion or other people's opinions or circumstances. We are letting the peace of God rule in our heart. And Father, we come forward. You said you would keep that which we commit unto you. We are making a commitment right now and we believe that you will hold us to it. We believe, Father, right now we have signed the paper and we've pushed it across the desk to you and we want you to fill it in and show us exactly what to do and we make a commitment that you are Lord and we're going to do what you say not what circumstances finances or any other thing dictates and Father we thank you for that Amen and we believe Father that you accept this we crawl up on the altar right now and make ourselves a living sacrifice and we receive it and thank you that you are showing us what to do we agree and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Man, that's awesome. You know, you've been sitting under the ministry of the word tonight. I believe that the Holy Spirit has been here bearing witness and convicting you. And so you've responded. But when you get on your own, you'll, your head will start telling you every reason that, why, what have I done? You know what? You need to go by what you felt in your heart and not let your intellect talk you out of this. And I believe if you'll do that, it's, it's going to be awesome. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, that's awesome. You can go back to your seat. We just love you and appreciate you. And I believe this is going to make a huge, huge difference in your life. We've got prayer ministers that are going to come up here and they will be here to help you tonight. And many of you may need to just come and say, all right, I've made the commitment. Now, pray with me about my house. Pray with me about my job. Pray with me about different things. And we'll have our prayer ministers up here to help you pray about that. And I think we've got a, uh, something else going over in the barn. So uh, who's going to share that? Mike, I'll let you come back and share with them what we're going to do.